morning to the book of Acts chapter 2, familiar setting of scripture for us. Now, I do have um, some handouts at the end of service if you're interested. Told you that, um, you know, we've been in a series studying apostolic doctrine and last week um, we presented to you a Bible study that that um, the Lord gave me some time back, and we have made those copies available. In fact, there are still several copies in the sound booth if you're interested um, of the last Bible study. Now, this one, uh, there are actually two copies that you need to pick up if you're interested in using this as a Bible study in uh, reaching others. Uh, one is the teacher's copy, and uh, you will see on that teacher's copy some words highlighted uh, in yellow, and then the other is the student copy, and that's for you, obviously, to distribute, for you to teach others this glorious truth, and it will have uh, blanks to fill in. The, uh, the words that are highlighted in yellow on your teacher's copy are the answers to the student's copy, right? We've tried to make this as easy as we can so that anybody can feel comfortable teaching a Bible study. Hallelujah. We are first and foremost called to be saints. That's, that's our calling. Every one of us have a calling from God. We're called to be saints. As saints... We have an obligation, first and foremost, to be witnesses. That's why God gave you the Holy Ghost. He gave it to you. He gave it to you to make you holy, to make you a saint. But he also gave it to you to empower you to reach others. God has chosen that he's going to work through us to reach the lost. And so it's our job, it's our obligation to do what we can. Amen. And we talked about, we talked about last, and I, I know you're standing, give me just a few minutes, but, but last week we talked about how that, you know, some folks just don't feel competent. Uh, they don't believe that they are capable of teaching Bible studies. And uh, I'm doing my best to to just absolutely shatter that myth. And that's what it is. It's a myth. If you've got the Holy Ghost, you can teach a Bible study. You can teach a Bible study. If you've got the Holy Ghost, you can do it. I'm not getting enough amens. Um, that's why I repeat it if you haven't figured that out. Um, if you've got the Holy Ghost, you can teach a Bible study. However, there, there are in so many minds these, these, um, barriers that we have created that cause us to lack the confidence we need to do it. And so when I say I'm doing my best to shatter the myth, what I mean by that is I'm trying to put together some Bible studies that are so simple and so easy that anybody can do it. And uh, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to do it. In fact, what you're going to have, what they're going to have, all the scriptures will be there. You don't even have to fumble trying to turn pages. It's all printed for you. Everything's there. I try to make it as simple as I can. Um, and, and you know, those of you that have been around any length of time know that's just my, my, um, uh, my MO, my modus operandi. That's, that's the way I operate is to make things simple. There are other men that are called, um, to, to, uh, expound and, uh, explain the complex. That's not me. Um, I just do things as simply as I can and I try to keep it as simple as possible. Amen. And uh, I've found that to be effective. And so we're going to go through another Bible study again today. And for the most part, again, I'm going to teach it 
as though I am sitting in someone's living room and teaching them this. In other words, I'm going to, I'm not going to treat it like we've got a room uh, that is um, full of apostolics who already know this message, but but I'm going to teach it as though you don't know any of it. Now, some of the scriptures we use again are going to be repetitive from other Bible studies that we have presented you with. But uh, again, these are things you have to take each of these within its own context and understand that this Bible study is an entity unto itself. And so the references that perhaps we included in another study are included here because these are not uh, a continuation, but they are separate. All right, everybody with me. Acts chapter 2, and beginning with verse number 13, Acts 2 and verse 13. And by the way, the reason why I make these available at the end of service and not during my teaching is because I've learned a few things through the years. I've learned if you give people several sheets of paper, they're going to sit and read rather than listen. And that's human nature. And I don't want you reading. I want you listening. Uh, if you're going to read, I just want you reading scripture while we're reading scripture. But, but I don't want you trying to get ahead of yourself and worrying about all of that. I promise you, you listen to today's study, you can take this immediately. In fact, you could go this afternoon and sit down with somebody and teach them this study. It's going to be that simple and straightforward. All right? Praise God. All right, Acts chapter 2, and beginning with verse number 13, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Now notice verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, do we believe the Bible? If we really believe the Bible, in fact, you know, I said I was going to try to teach this uh, as though you don't know the truth, but I can't ignore the facts of what's here. And so we as apostolics love to quote Peter on the day of Pentecost. But I don't hear a whole lot of quoting of Acts 2 and 21. And yet it's the same man speaking under the same anointing, unction, and influence as the one who speaks in verse 38. In verse 21, he makes a statement, plain and simple. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so he he makes it clear. That if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. That's what he said. Some of you are hesitant to say amen to that, but that's what he said. And so it behooves us to find out what he means by calling on the name of the Lord. Because that's what it's going to take to be saved. So we got to find out what that means. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is calling on the name of the Lord. Now, would you, I wouldn't do this in a home per se, not at this point, but, but again, we have to make a few exceptions. Would you just put your Bible down 
I want you to pray with me, church, because again, we've seen and God, God has helped us the things that are on the website. We've seen people converted by listening to what's on our website. And, and we want to, we want to see that happen again. I want God to use this lesson, not only to empower you to teach it, but, but I want others to get a revelation of truth. Amen. In fact, we need to just make this available on the website, the, uh, the actual documents and let them download it and follow along so we can, we can do that. Let's pray together, everyone. Lord, in Jesus name. There is nothing that can be accomplished without the help of the Holy Ghost. God, I pray that you'll anoint me today. You'll anoint these people, O oh God. Lord God, if you would somehow, Lord Jesus, let the spirit of revelation come. God, not only to those that are here, but to those who will hear this later. I'm asking, O oh Lord Jesus, that you would grant it, that souls might be saved. Use this, God. As a tool, Lord, to reach others. We thank you in Jesus' name. Could we praise him one more time before we're seated today? Everybody, let's give God some praise right now. Come on, let's lift our voices in adoration to the Lord. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Now, <clears throat> this, this Bible study in part came about because of a conversation that I had in a local restaurant. I was there with a visiting minister and we were uh, trying to witness to waitress that was serving us that day. And uh, we shared a few scriptures with her, and uh, she then began to explain to us that, you know, us quoting scripture didn't really um, affect her because these were her words. Everyone gets something different out of the Bible. You interpret it your way, and I interpret it mine. Now, listen to me. If if that really is a fact, then I'm here to tell you that the Bible becomes a meaningless book. If it can mean anything, then it means nothing. Do you get that? If, if a scripture can mean just anything we want it to mean, then it really means nothing at all. And so we can't just come along and assign our own interpretation to any scripture. In fact, the apostle Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Hallelujah. Amen. There, that's better. Read. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It is of no private interpretation. Uh, I've said many, many times, and we need to understand and we need to agree that the only reliable commentary on scripture is other scripture. If we cannot define a scripture by scripture, then we've got problems. Uh, while I do look to others for, for word meanings and historical references, I'm going to tell you that the one source that I absolutely trust when it comes to explaining a scripture is more scripture. But in far too many instances, someone has interpreted a scripture in a certain way, and then it becomes the accepted interpretation, and everyone seems to just jump on that bandwagon rather than study it out for themselves. They just come to accept whatever someone else has said. And, uh, and that's, that's the reason that, um, that, that I've spent so much time warning, not only here, but in my efforts in Africa, I, I do my best to warn over and over and over, 
Don't fall into the trap of allowing your tradition to be exalted above the truth of Scripture. Amen. Jesus warned about this. Mark chapter 7 and verse 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered. And many such things, such like things do ye. Now listen, I want you to understand what Jesus just said. He said they made the word of God of none effect because of their tradition. It's not that they rejected the word of God. It's that they allowed their tradition to offer explanation of what the word meant. Oh, they quoted scripture. They used scripture. But their tradition became the defining reference for any passage that they wanted to discuss. And Jesus said, don't do that. Your tradition is not what's important. It's what's in the word of God that's important. Amen. We are not going to be judged by tradition. We're not going to be judged by commentaries. We're not going to be judged by lexicons. We're going to be judged by the word of God. Amen. Jesus said this in John 12 and 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Does everybody see that Jesus just stated his word is what's going to judge us? It's his word. It's his word. In fact, we see this actually happening in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 and 12. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Now, now I want you to pay attention, especially to verse 12, and what is said here. The dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books, plural, were opened. And another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. That singular book that's referenced is defined for us. It's the book of life. Amen. And you know, so many people that I that I talk to, that I witness to, that I deal with, their, their big concern is, is my name written in the book of life? And that needs to be a concern. In fact, Jesus said that's that's uh, a greater thing than even seeing devils cast out. You ought to rejoice more over the fact that your name is in the book of life than you do over the fact that we have power over demons. So I'm not trying to downplay the importance of the book of life, but I'm just going to tell you that's not the only book that's going to be opened on Judgment Day. The book of life is going to be opened, but there will be other Books that are open. Now, if we let scripture interpret scripture, Jesus just told us in John 12, 48, that his word is what's going to judge us. Therefore, I conclude that this, uh, this word books is a reference to the 66 books of the Bible. Not only is the book of life going to be open, but the books of the Bible are going to be opened. And then notice what he says. This is the second thing I want you to notice. The dead are going to be judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So in other words, what God is going to do, yes, he's going to check to see if your name is in the book of life. But he's also going to open the word of God. And he's going to find out if you obeyed what the scripture told you. Nowhere does he open a book of tradition. Nowhere does he open a denominational handbook. Well... Nowhere does he open papal declarations. Hallelujah. But he does open the word of God. And he's going to judge us based on whether or not we did what the word tells us to do. 
And so obviously we have to depend solely on the word of God as our source of absolute truth. John 17, 17, we use it a lot, but it's important to us. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word. Thy word is truth. His word is truth. Amen. Now, other books may contain truth, but the Bible doesn't just contain truth. The Bible is truth. You do understand the difference. A book that contains truth may also contain error. But this book we call the Bible doesn't just contain truth. It is truth. Therefore, there's no error in it. From beginning to end, there is no error. Everything written in the pages of Scripture is right. It's true. Hallelujah. And it doesn't matter if people believe it or don't believe it. It doesn't change the veracity of the Word of God. Amen. Romans chapter 3 verse 4, Paul said this. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man alive. Let God be true, but every man alive. I like to say this. God does not operate his kingdom on democratic principles. In other words, God's not taking a vote to find out what the majority believes. God is not interested in how many believe this and how many believe that. God simply states truth. And if everybody rejects it, it's still truth. Hallelujah. So having said all that by way of introduction, let's now look at our text. Let's go back and let's talk about the statement that Peter made. Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, as we start examining this verse of scripture, I want to ask you this morning. First of all, it should always be our practice to open our hearts and open our minds when we open the word of God. Always give God the opportunity to speak to you. And that means that we're going to have to lay aside some of our traditions, lay aside uh, the words of some of the commentators, and look solely to the scriptures. And that's what we're going to do. We are going to let scripture interpret scripture to find out what is meant by calling on the name of the Lord. Because Peter said, whoever does that shall be saved. Whoever calls on the Lord's name shall be saved. So we want to find out what that means. Amen. First of all, let's talk about what it doesn't mean. Because much of the church world today tells people, you want to be saved, you just accept the Lord as your personal Savior. Or many of them will say, pray the sinner's prayer. You ever heard that? Heard that term? Just pray the sinner's prayer. If you pray the sinner's prayer, then then you'll be saved. Um, well, let me tell you, Peter said, if you'll call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. So we want to find out if praying the sinner's prayer is what he meant. We want to find out if accepting the Lord is what he meant. We want to find out if just believing in Jesus is what he meant by calling on the name of the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, that's not what he meant. And I want to prove it from the scripture. Let's, let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, and listen to what Jesus said. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, now listen. These two scriptures cannot contradict each other. Peter said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus said, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to be saved. Those two scriptures cannot contradict. Therefore, just simply speaking his name, just simply praying a prayer is not calling on the name of the Lord. 
In fact, Jesus goes on to tell us who will be saved. Let's finish the verse. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. This is who's going to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's those that do the will of the Father. All right? So, so listen, I, I hope you're following me this morning. Peter said, you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Jesus said, you do the will of my Father, you'll be saved. Those are not contradictory statements. They are complementary statements. In other words, they have to mean the same thing. Calling on the name of the Lord must mean doing the will of the Father. We cannot call on the Lord's name scripturally if we don't do the Father's will. Do you see that? And so, so just repeating a sinner's prayer or just saying I accept Christ or saying I believe that he died and rose again. It's not about saying the right words. It's about doing the right thing. Praise God. And so it becomes incumbent upon us then to find out what the will of the Father is with regard to salvation. Right? If doing the will of the Father is what saves us, then I want to know what the will of the Father is Concerning salvation. Let's look to the scriptures. Let's find out. Uh, Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish. Now, 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 hang on. Not willing. So we're, we're getting a glimpse into God's will. Right? He's not willing that any should perish. But that all but come. that all right now look again let's let's look at it grammatically if he's not willing that they should perish the conjunction but tells us this is what he is willing to have happen right he's not willing that you should perish but his will is what that all should that come, all should come to, repentance. to repentance. I submit to you this morning that that you cannot do the will of the Father without repentance. This is the will of the Father. He's not willing that you perish, but he does will that you repent. Right. And so when Peter said, you got to call on the name of the Lord. Obviously, calling on the name of the Lord must include repentance. Right? I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. I don't, I don't want to become redundant. But again, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, um, to get rid of false doctrine and false concepts. So, so, if what would keep us from perishing is praying the sinner's prayer, it seems to me Peter would have said, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all would pray the sinner's prayer. If what would keep us from perishing is accepting Christ as our Savior, then Peter should have said, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should accept the Lord as their Savior. Do you see what I'm telling you? But what he says is, This is the will of the Father that you repent. Praise God. And so calling on the name of the Lord must include repentance. Now, let's talk about repentance for just a few moments. Because again, there's a great misconcept as to what repentance really is. Repentance involves a number of things. And it's not just saying, I'm sorry. There's more to repentance than just saying, I'm sorry, or saying, I believe, or just admitting that you're a sinner. That's not repentance. Let's, again, let's let the scripture interpret scripture. Second Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So godly sorrow works repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. We see there's two kinds of sorrow. There is a godly sorrow and there is a worldly sorrow. Real repentance involves godly sorrow. Amen. Now, godly sorrow means that you're going to have to feel 
that sorrow coming from a godly perspective. You got to see your sin the way God sees it. You've got to understand your sin is going to destroy your soul. Your sin is not just a bad habit that, you know, you ought to, uh, you ought to make some New Year's resolution to change. That's not what sin is from God's perspective. Sin, as God sees it, is far more than bad habits. Sin brings death. You've got to see your sin that way. And it's got to create in you a godly sorrow that will work repentance. Now, let me tell you what else repentance involves. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And so so we see here, uh, the, the writer of Proverbs said, if you want to try to cover your sin, you're not going to prosper. But if you want to find mercy, there's two things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to confess your sin. Now, we're not talking about confessing it to a man because your sin is against God. You confess it to God. But just confessing it, which is usually a part of the sinner's prayer, at least stating that I am a sinner, that's a part of this sinner's prayer they talk about. And so they say, well, we are confessing our sin. But there's more to it if you want mercy than just admitting you're a sinner. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh his sins shall have mercy. So real repentance involves a godly sorrow. It involves confessing your sins. It involves forsaking your sins. If you repent of your sin, you're going to change your life. Well, praise God. Amen. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Listen to what Jesus said. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Oh, I'm telling you, if there is a verse that is applicable to today's religious society, it's this one. Because everybody that calls himself a Christian says Jesus is my Lord. But Jesus wants to know, if you're going to call me Lord, why don't you obey me? What is a Lord? That's not just a pretty title. It means one who is in authority over another. In fact, not just authority, but absolute authority. And if we're going to call Jesus our Lord, then we have an obligation to obey our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19, Paul said this. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. Having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and And let let everyone that nameth the name of Christ Christ. depart from iniquity. Oh, do you see this? We're talking about what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? It's not just praying a sinner's prayer. It's not just accepting Christ as your Savior. But Paul said, let everybody that calls on his name depart from iniquity. There's got to be a change in your lifestyle. If you're an alcoholic, you repent, you quit drinking alcohol. You're a fornicator, you repent, you stop the fornication. Well, hallelujah. You've got to depart from iniquity. If you're really going to call on the name of the Lord, that's a part of repentance. God is not willing that any should perish, right? But look at this, Luke 13 and 3. These are the words of Jesus. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, except you, repent you, shall all you shall perish. Hallelujah. He's not willing that any should perish. But he tells us, if you don't repent, you will perish. And so we understand that doing the will of the Father, that's what Jesus said is necessary for salvation. We understand doing the will of the Father. That's part of calling on the name of the Lord. Doing the will of the Father requires repentance. You must repent. 
to call on the name of the Lord. Now, that's not all. Let's see what else is a part of calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 22, verses 12 through 16. Now, this is the testimony of the Apostle Paul. He's talking about his own personal experience. Read. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked up upon him, and Mm -hmm. he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will. That you should know his will. And see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Uh huh. Now watch verse sixteen. And now why? And now thou? why tarriest thou? Arise. Arise. And be baptized. And be baptized. And wash away. Wash thy away sins. thy sins. Doing Call, what? Calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord. Are we going to let Scripture interpret Scripture today? Peter said, you got to call on the name of the Lord if you want to be saved. We've already seen calling on the name of the Lord is not just speaking his name, but it involves repentance. Now we find out there's something else that's a part of calling on the name of the Lord according to Scripture. To call on the name of the Lord, you've got to be baptized. Hallelujah. If you've never been baptized, you have not truly called on his name. Praise God. Now look, we, we have to obey his commands, right? Isn't that what he said? If I'm your Lord, you have to do what I tell you to do. So let's consider one of his commands. Mark 16 and 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. I'm telling you, Jesus gives us a command that we have to be baptized in order to be saved. This is a part of calling on the name of the Lord. I'm here to tell you today, calling on the name of the Lord is not what you say, it's what you do. Praise God. Amen. Amen. He commanded that we be baptized. He also said we believe on him through the word of his apostles. This is John 17 and verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. All right, so in his prayer, in John 17, he's praying for his disciples, uh, later called apostles. He's praying for them. Then the prayer changes, and he said, I'm not just praying for them, but I'm going to pray for everybody that's going to believe on me through their word. He says the way that we're going to believe on him is through the word that his apostles speak. And so if we're talking about baptism, it's a part of calling on the name of the Lord. It's one of his commands. We got to find out how the apostles taught for us to be baptized. Let's look in Acts chapter 10, verses 46 to 48. They, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized. And he commanded them to be baptized. How? In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Amen. And I love when I'm in Africa, I love to get them to read this verse in uh, in their language. They have the Bible in their native language, whatever country I'm in. And and what I've found is without exception, if I get them to read it in their language, it doesn't just say in the name of the Lord, but it will say in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that name is specifically mentioned in other translations. I'm here to tell you, there's only one Lord that's acknowledged by Christians anywhere. And if you're going to be baptized in the name of the Lord, you're going to have to speak the name of Jesus. The the apostles did not baptize saying Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but they baptized only in the name of Jesus Christ. So baptism in Jesus' name is a part of calling on the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now that's not all. That's not all. Let's, let's see what else is involved in calling on the name of the Lord. Let's go to the Old Testament. The prophet Zechariah. Zechariah 13 and verse 9. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. And will try them as gold is tried. 
They shall call on now, my now name. Now look at this. They shall do what? Call on my name. They shall call on my name. And I will hear them. And I'll hear them? I will say it is my people. I'll say it's my people. And they shall say, and they shall say the, Lord is my the Lord is my God. And so here in this verse, and I'm not going to take the time to get into the, the depth of the interpretation of this verse, but I do want to make an application. It becomes very clear to me when I read this. He's talking about his people. They shall say he is my God. And I'm going to say they are my people because they have called on my name. But he said those that that call on my name, they are going to pass through the fire. So obviously calling on his name involves fire. Hallelujah. Fire is a refining agent. And God intends for his people to be refined by fire, just as a jeweler might use a blowtorch to refine gold or silver, God uses the fire of the Holy Ghost to purify his followers. Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize, he you, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And with Fire. Read. Whose fan is in his, his hand, fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge He's, his floor. He will thoroughly purge his floor. He'll gather his wheat into the He's going to gather his wheat into the garner. He will burn up He'll the burn chap, up the with, chap unquenchable with unquenchable fire. fire. I'm telling you that John the Baptist proclaimed when, when Jesus comes, he's going to do a work among his people. And what he's going to do is he's going to baptize them with the Holy Ghost and fire. I'm here to tell you today that part of calling on the name of the Lord involves receiving the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Jesus said this is a part of true believing in John chapter 7 verses 38 and 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his bellies shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. They that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. I'm telling you that if you truly call on the name of the Lord, it's going to involve the fire of the Holy Ghost. Calling on the name of the Lord means you're going to have to repent. It means you're going to have to be baptized in Jesus' name. And it means you're going to have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It's not what you say, it's what you do. Now, there is one final thing that needs to be pointed out as a part of calling on the name of the Lord according to scriptural definition. And again, we're going to go to the Old Testament. Let's go to the prophet Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9. And once again, I'm not going to try to interpret it, but I am going to make an application. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9 says this. Then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may call, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord. That they may all do what? Call upon the name of the Lord. Is anybody following me this morning? We're talking about calling on the name of the Lord. And here's another scripture that uses that phrase, but it talks about something happening. Then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him, to with, serve one. him with one consent. Now, I, I want you to notice this pure language. I want you to think for just a moment. Could you name a language that God would consider pure? Is there a language on earth that contains no profanity? Is there a language on earth that has never been used to tell a lie? Is there a language on earth that has no words to describe the evil deeds of men? I don't think so. I don't think that there is a language on earth that we could really say is a pure language. But God said when you call on his name, he is going to give to his people a pure language. Language. Hallelujah. Amen. 
And so we see a person repents. They're baptized in Jesus' name. They receive the Holy Ghost fire for purification. Now notice what happens when you receive the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. They were all filled. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak speak with other tongues or other languages as the spirit gave them utterance. I'm telling you that with the baptism of the Holy Ghost comes a new language that is foreign to the believer. You don't know what the words mean. You have no idea what you're saying. Therefore, you cannot corrupt that language. You can't lie when you're talking in tongues. You can't talk about evil deeds when you're talking in tongues. You can't discuss the wicked things of this world when you're speaking in tongues. I'm telling you, this is what God does for his people. He turns to them a pure language. Hallelujah. Amen. And why does he do it? Why does he do it? Read Zephaniah 3 and 9 again. But then while I turn to the people. I'll turn language, to the people of pure language. They may, that, that they may, they may call, call upon, the upon the name of the Lord. So him. they can serve him with one consent. God said this is the purpose behind the pure language. This is the reason why I let it happen. I'm going to put within them a heart that will cause them to want to serve me. It will cause them to want to be what I want them to be. Listen, when somebody says, I can't live like a Christian, I'm going to tell you, it's because you're lacking something. God needs to turn to you a pure language. And when he gives you that pure language, he changes your desires. The things you used to love, you now hate. And the things you used to hate, you now love. Hallelujah. And you can serve him. With one consent. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now he said, I, I'm going to do this so they may call on the name of the Lord. What did our text say in Acts 2 and 21? And it shall come to, it pass, shall come to pass that whosoever shall, whosoever call, on shall the the call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. Hallelujah. Somebody said, prove to me in the scripture that I have to speak in tongues. I just did. If you're going to be saved, you got to call on the name of the Lord. And part of calling on the name of the Lord is when he gives you that pure language. You have never called on his name scripturally until you've talked in tongues. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. And so... And so let us review what we've learned here this morning. And and then let's compare what we've discovered to other verses of scripture dealing with salvation and see if everything lines up. To begin with, we learn that calling on the name of the Lord involves, somebody help me here, involves what? Repentance. It involves baptism in Jesus' name. It involves Receiving the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in tongues. Now, when Jesus told Nicodemus what he had to do to be saved, notice what was involved. John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Unless he's born of water. And born of the spirit, he cannot enter, he cannot enter. the kingdom of God. Oh, I love the consistency of the scripture. Peter said you got to call on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord involves baptism and receiving the Holy Ghost. Jesus said you got to be born of water and you got to be born of the spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, let's go down to verse 8, John 3, verse 8. The wind bloweth where it the wind listeth. bloweth where it listeth. Now here's the you hear the sound thereof, but, can't not but you can't tell it where it's coming from it or where it goes so to. Is so is everyone that is born of the spirit. Not most, not many, not those that have the gift. Everybody that's born of the spirit is going to be like what Jesus just described. And here's what he said. There's a lot of things about the wind we don't know. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it's going. But one thing is consistent. Every time the wind blows, you hear its sound. 
The beautiful thing about this, the word sound here is from the Greek word phone, which means language. That's what it means. Language. So Jesus said, we, there's a lot about the wind we don't know, but the one consistency is this. The wind has a language all its own. And when the wind starts blowing, you hear its language. And then he said, so is everybody that's born of the spirit. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, this is exactly in John chapter three, verses five through eight, exactly what we've seen about calling on the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. We know Nicodemus was living a repented life, but then Jesus said, you've got to be baptized and you've got to receive the Holy Ghost. And furthermore, when you're born of the spirit, you're going to speak in tongues. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I know he didn't specifically say speak in tongues. He just said, you'll hear the sound, but there's only one sound that is consistent that we see in the scriptures consistently when somebody receives the Holy Ghost. Let's go through it here quickly. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. And they were all filled with the they Holy Ghost. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and what happened? And began to speak they began to speak with other tongues as the, Spirit gave, as the Spirit gave them utterance. When they received the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues. Acts chapter 10, verses 45 and 46. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on, gen- on the Gentiles also was poured out. The, the Gentiles the received the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them this is how tongues. they knew they'd received it because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify, and magnify God. God. Amen. Acts chapter 19 verse 6. And when Paul had laid when his, Paul hands, laid on his them, hands on them, the Holy Ghost, the came, Holy Ghost came on them. They spake with, they tongues, spake with and tongues and they prophesied. I'm here to tell you out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. We've got three witnesses in the scripture. When they received the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues. And I'm here to tell you when you receive it, you'll speak in tongues. And if you haven't spoken in tongues, you've never received it. Hallelujah. And so when we compare what we found about calling on the name of the Lord, repentance, baptism, Jesus name, receiving the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues, we compare that to what Jesus said about salvation. It matches perfectly. Let's see what Peter has to say about salvation in Acts chapter two and beginning with verse number 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. When they heard this, they're pricked in their heart. And, said unto Peter, and they said to Peter, the rest of the apostles, the rest of the apostles men, and brethren, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? Tell us plainly. Now, this is, this is at the conclusion of the message we read from in our text. In Acts chapter 2, Peter was preaching to this crowd on the day of Pentecost. In verse 21, he said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord is going to be saved. And I've told you that from the scripture, what he means by calling on the name of the Lord is repentance, baptism in Jesus name and receiving the Holy Ghost. So let's see if that's what Peter says when he's asked plainly, what do we have to do? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them. Then Peter said unto them. Repent. Repent. And be baptized. And be baptized. Every one of you. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the Christ, name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise, for the promise is to you and to your children and to, your children, and to all that are afar off. Even as, even as many as the Lord God our God, God shall Call. I'm to Peter got up and told the crowd. He explained to them what it means to call on the name of the Lord. It's not praying the sinner's prayer. It's not believing on the Lord. It's not accepting Christ as your savior, but it is repentance. It is baptism in Jesus name. It is receiving the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in other tongues. And whosoever will call on the name of the Lord. They shall be saved. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for that truth today. How about you? Let's stand 
Everybody, let's lift our hands to the Lord right now. Come on, let's love him. Let's love him. Let's love him. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, let's love him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Praise God, praise God. Church, let me say this. I want everybody under the sound of my voice to purpose in your heart that in 2019, if the Lord tarries his coming, that you are going to teach a Bible study. Now, I know one doesn't sound like a lot, but I can promise you this. You teach one, let it be effective. You won't stop with one. You'll be out teaching another one and another one and another one. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so what I want to do for this altar call today, of course, if you're here without the Holy Ghost, the Lord wants to give it to you. Repent of your sins. He'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. We'll baptize you in Jesus name. But to the rest of the church, let me say, here's what I want to happen in this altar call. I want you to come and make a commitment to God that Lord, I'm going to give it my best. I'm going to teach at least one Bible study in the coming year. Lead me to somebody. Show me somebody. Order my steps direct my path. I want to win somebody this year to you. Can we do it? Let's gather around the front. Let's make a couple.